My name is Michael Battelle, and I'm the president and founder of the Fatty Liver Alliance. We raise awareness about the risk causes and complications of fatty liver disease and help those already diagnosed with massive and mash by advocating for access to approved treatments and care. Our very special guest today is Dr. Sonal Kumar, who is an assistant professor of medicine and the director of gastroenterology and hepatology at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. In part one of our 10-part Liver Insights 2 series, we're going to be speaking about Massel Dimash and what every patient needs to know. So Dr. Kumar, we estimate that about 40% of the population has fatty liver disease, which we refer to as Massel, the beginning of it anyway, and many have progressed to MASH. What are these liver diseases about? How did we get them? And what does it really mean for our overall health? Thanks, Mike, for having me here today. I'm always happy to to speak with you and uh, you. try and, uh, you know, give out information that might help patients. Um, so you're right. Massold is a very common liver disease that we are seeing more and more in our in our patient population. Uh, it's a disease spectrum. So Massold stands for metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. And that's a mouthful. Um, just so everyone is on the same page, this was a disease that was formerly called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD or just fatty liver disease in general. But over the last year, year and a half, we had a, a name change to more accurately re represent what, what's going on. Um, but Massold is a, a disease spectrum. So it doesn't mean that everyone who has Massold is going to go into liver failure or everyone is going to have cirrhosis or need a liver transplant. In fact, the majority of patients don't end up progressing to cirrhosis and needing a liver transplant. doesn't mean we shouldn't care about it and address it, um, but it is very much a disease spectrum that sort of occurs in stages. So the first stage or the first thing that happens is that we develop fat in the liver. Um, so it's normal to have a little bit of fat in the liver, when, but when you have excess fat, that is steatosis, um, that just steatosis just needs fat. Um, and when you have excess fat in the liver, it's steatotic liver disease. And so that's where we get that, that name Massold. Now, when you have steatosis in the just in the liver or just fat in the liver, it doesn't cause any compromise to your liver function. But we think that about one in four patients with steatosis, with fat in the liver, will progress to have inflammation in the liver, what we call steatohepatitis or MASH, uh, metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis. And when you have steatohepatitis, that is when there is damage to the liver cells. So the cells are breaking apart, they're inflamed. Um, now, the good thing about the liver is that uh, it has the ability to regenerate. So although you're, you know, damaging these liver cells, the liver is, you know, working a little bit extra hard, but it's able to regenerate new healthy liver cells. But as long as you have the underlying risk factors, that disease can progress and you can get scarring in the liver. We call that scar uh, that scarring fibrosis. And we stage fibrosis anywhere from zero, meaning no fibrosis, no long-term damage to the liver, to stage four, which is cirrhosis. And we think about one in four people with MASH. So uh, one in four people with steatosis will get MASH and one in four people with MASH will develop cirrhosis. And once you get to cirrhosis, that's when we really worry about the liver risks. That's when we think it's permanent, there's an increased risk of liver cancer, and that's when we start worrying about uh, your liver function. So it's very much a disease spectrum and really important that you know where you fall under that disease in that in that spectrum, um, because sometimes you can't tell just by based on symptoms or even some lab values and you need further testing for that. Now, Massold is, you know, part of the reason why we, we changed the name is that it is very much a metabolic process. So just like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, 
heart disease, all of these are metabolic processes. And this is the metabolic process that occurs in the liver. Um, and so that's, that's what's going on. And it's really very much related to, to diet and obesity. We know that plays a big role in, in the risks in, uh, for patients to develop fatty liver disease. Now there is some genetic component as well. And there are a small percentage of patients with mast cells who are not overweight or don't have obesity. Um, but for, for the majority of patients, it's really related to weight and, and diet. Well, what now patients are going to be asking probably, and probably asking their physicians when they talk to them, but is there a way to just avoid it in the first place? Uh, or is it inevitable? We're all, you said, you said uh, uh, fat in the liver is normal. Um, and maybe you can comment on, on, on what percentage of your liver is, you know, involved with fat and what's considered still, I guess, no fat is the best thing, but healthy still. Yeah. So uh, about 5% is what we say is normal um, in, in the liver to have some fat in the liver. So anything above that really five to 10%, we would say is excess fat in the liver. And I think it could be surprising for people when they learn that they have a uh, muscle or fatty liver disease. I know I was, and I, I got the first time I did a, a fiber scan and I got this, the score that they call the cap score, uh, was 319. And I said, oh, that's like over 70% of my liver had fat. And I said, oh my God, what? Like, first of all, I didn't believe it. So I had this like, there's no way that's real. And I checked with a whole bunch of people and they said, no, no, it's real. And, and so it, it but, but over uh, about a year and a half, I was able to bring it down to like 187, which is, which is great, which is normal. So I know that people can, if they really work at the lifestyle, most people can make an impact on that fat, right? Absolutely. And this, you know, like I said, it's real, it's reversible until you get to cirrhosis. So even if you, whether you have steatosis or steatohepatitis or even uh, some fibrosis, it is reversible. Now it's not easy. Um, you have to be really committed uh, to, to getting the fat down, but it's really a matter of diet and exercise for, and for weight loss for the majority of patients. Um, there have been a lot of lifestyle modification studies that have looked at patients with muscled and shown that even at small weight reductions, even at three to 5%, we start to see improvement in that fat in the liver. Now, the goal is uh, really what we tell patients is to lose 10% of your body weight, because that's where we really see the improvement in inflammation, imp improvement in fibrosis, but we, it's not an all or nothing process. We do start to see improvement at, at small amounts of weight loss as well. And we are going to have other parts of the Liver Insight series talking specifically about lifestyle management. And, and today, I wanted to talk with you uh, to really understand what happens to the liver too. So we know now, you know, that, that the liver does heal itself. And I think some of the scarring that happens early on is because the liver is trying to heal itself, right? It's the, but it's the excess amount after it's, it's not reversible anymore. That's the problem, right? Yeah, the real problem occurs when you get to the more advanced stages, like stage three and stage four, the more fibrosis you have, the harder it is to sort of backtrack. Um, like I said, it doesn't mean that you can't, um, can't do it, but it becomes harder as the disease progresses. And that's why it's really important that we one, diagnose it very early, but also intervene as early as possible. Okay, so, so what would you say to uh, patients that are listening that said, well, like I feel exactly like I felt before. I feel fine. I don't have I don't have any symptoms. And yeah, the doctor just told me that I have fat in my liver. But like, so what? I can I'll worry about it when you know when it becomes more serious. I have so many other health conditions that I'm focused on. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think the good and bad of the liver is that a lot of liver diseases, including mass older, are, are asymptomatic until you get to more advanced, advanced stages of liver disease. Um, so you're able to live your life, you're able to do what you need to do without knowing. Um, but the problem is, is that it's still there's still damage going on in the liver and that disease can progress. And like I said, you know, it's easier to deal with it when it's in the early stages, as opposed to when you have cirrhosis and, you know, you're worrying about screening for liver cancer. And, you know, we, we really want to intervene as early as possible. The other thing to remember is that liver is not the only 
a risk um, with having mast cell, like liver, the risk of having cirrhosis or liver cancer or whatever it may be. Um, mast cell is, is also considered a cardiovascular risk factor. So it does increase your risk of having a heart attack, stroke, things like that. Because again, this is a metabolic process. So they all are very, all of these diseases are very closely related. And especially in early stages of mast cell, the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in patients is actually cardiovascular disease. So and, important that you care about it early. That, Sorry. No, no, you're a hundred percent. I'm really happy that you mentioned that. And I was going to say, and it is a, uh, a two way street really, even with type two diabetes, because it can also exacerbate or even cause type two diabetes, right. For, for people. So it, you're, I, what you said was a hundred percent, uh, right. That it's, the, it's a whole metabolic, um, I used the word the other day, tapestry. I don't know why, but that's what it feels like to me. It's like uh, this whole woven, interwoven relationships, right? Yeah, I always tell patients that the all of these diseases are very bi-directional. So they each increase the risk of each other. And so you really need to sort of tackle it holistically and think of overall what's the underlying, you know, problem or what you need to manage. And a lot of it's diet, lifestyle modifications. Like I said, there there's some genetic factors as well. So there will be some unmodifiable risk factors. Um, but all of, you know, if you, if you take care of the di diabetes, it's going to affect the liver. If you take care of the liver, it's going to improve diabetes. It, it, it works both ways. Okay. So last question. Um, what would you say would be the one piece of advice to people? They go to their doctor, doctor says, you know, you need to really exercise more and eat less and lose whatever, five to 10%, as you said, 10% of your weight. And they're like rolling their eyes inside their head probably and saying, oh my God, I've tried that for like 20 years and I, 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 I've tried every diet in the world and it, it's not working for me. So they sort of leave and feel horrible about themselves. And uh, I don't want that to be, you know, a message that patients have. So what words of hope could you offer to patients that they might be able to either say to their physician or even to their other family members so that they can start this healing process? Yeah, I think, you know, you, you just mentioned say to their family members, and I, this is what I always tell, tell patients. One, it's not easy. Um, you know, whether you're losing five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, it's really difficult. Um, and I tell patients that um, this has to come from everybody at home and it has to be a really concerted effort for the entire family. You can't have one person making lifestyle modifications, going to the gym, eating salads for lunch and the rest of the family not participating. So I think, uh, you know, it's really important to get everyone on board and share information with those in your household to help, um, help you on this process. I've noticed that when patients do that, it, there's a lot higher success rate um, with that. And then I always tell patients that, you know, don't say I need to lose 100 pounds in three months. Let's take baby steps. Like I said, with muscle, you, you start seeing improvement with really small amounts of weight loss. And once you get to one point, then you set another goal. I, I, it doesn't have to be quick. And it doesn't have to be very dramatic in the beginning. And slowly you will you will get there. I think the other thing to, you know, really uh, ask your provider about is the resources in terms of working with a dietitian. So sometimes they're covered by insurance, some hospital systems, some clinics have access to a dietitian, and they can really help um, help you stay on track. Or even there are apps now that that will really help, um, you know, with coaching on how to make dietary modifications. Wonderful advice. Thank you for sharing your experiences because you see patients all the time. And I know that uh, people will watch this probably more than once just to <laughs> take notes and remember what you said. So thanks very much. I, I do appreciate what you do for patients every day. Thank you so much for having me.